And welcome back to Unit H. We are now moving on to H4, atoms and molecules in a chemical reaction. So, so far in this unit, we've talked about burning fuels for energy, um, and we've also talked about some other chemical reactions that give us energy. But before we get too much deeper into chemical reactions, we should probably understand some of the basics about how atoms behave in chemical reactions. So, our first question is, what do the atoms involved in a chemical reaction do? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. The atoms in the reactants are rearranged and joined together in different combinations to make new products. So let's try to illustrate that with some of our examples here on this page. So if we look at our, if we look at our first chemical reaction, iron plus copper sulfate, goes to make iron sulfate plus copper. Below we have our, our chemical equation using, uh, using symbols, and the symbols are a handy way to picture what happens to the atoms in a reaction, because each symbol corresponds to one atom. So if we look at what happens to the atoms in this first reaction, we see that iron starts off all by itself, and copper starts off bound to sulfate. Then, just like we said, the atoms in the reactants, which are the iron, copper, and the sulfate, they rearrange, they get jumbled around, and they join together in new combinations to make our products. So if we look over on the right side, instead of iron by itself, we now have iron bound to sulfate, and we have copper by itself. So that's an example of how um, atoms rearrange themselves and join together in new combinations. So another key point about how atoms behave in a reaction is that no atoms are ever created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. And this is a key point that I'll make throughout the lesson today, that no atoms are ever created or destroyed during a chemical reaction. So a good example to picture what I'm talking about is the reaction of magnesium burning in oxygen going to make magnesium oxide the chemical equation of which is written below. So if we look, the symbol for magnesium is Mg, and oxygen gas is O2. So if we just wrote out what that product would look like, we would expect it to be um, something like, and we know that we make magnesium oxide, and the symbol for magnesium oxide is MgO. But if we only had MgO as a product, then we'd only have one oxygen, right? But we started with two oxygens over here. So that's why we need, that's why we make two um, molecules of magnesium oxide as a product. But then, in our products, if we have two magnesium atoms, then we must have started with two magnesium atoms, so that's why we have to add this two out front. So this is what we call a balanced chemical equation, is when we have the same number of atoms on each side. So, so what, what are the implications of this idea about how atoms behave in a reaction? Well, I'm going to repeat again the key point that I made on the first slide. That is, during a chemical reaction, atoms are never created or destroyed. Um, as we said, atoms are only rearranged and jumbled around and combined together in different combinations. So nothing gets used up or, um, or created. And so since, um, since the atoms in a substance make up that substance's mass, then we can also conclude that we must not, we must not uh, lose or create any mass as well. So, for instance, if you start with 100, 100 grams of reactants, you must always end up with 100 grams of product. There are no exceptions to this rule. So here's one illustrated example of how the mass of reactants must always equal the mass of the products. So on our scale on the left, we measure the mass of our iron powder. We find that it's 56 grams. We measure the mass of our copper sulfate solution. We find that it's 160 grams. So the total mass of our reactants is 216 grams. And if the rule that I just told you is true, 
then we must have the exact same amount of grams in our product. So let's look over at what our product is. Our product is iron 2 sulfate solution, and indeed when we put that on the balance we get 216 grams. So, so our rule holds true. And like I said, there's no exception to this rule. But, some of you might be asking, but sometimes after a chemical reaction, the products seem to weigh less or weigh more than the reactants. So what's up with that? So one example of this is when we burn magnesium in air. Um, and so let's say I started with a strip of magnesium ribbon that weighs 100 grams and then I expose it to a flame and I end up with a bunch of white powder afterwards and the name of that white powder is magnesium oxide and it turns out if I weighed this magnesium oxide it would be heavier than my initial magnesium strip it actually would work out to be something greater than 100 let's say it comes out to be 150 grams but didn't I just tell you that, that we cannot create or destroy atoms or create or destroy mass so where did those extra 50 grams come from? I told you there's no exception to the rule, so the so the, those extra 50 grams must have came from somewhere, because that we can't create them out of thin air. So what actually happens when we burn magnesium is that oxygen molecules from the air are joined with the magnesium, and that's why our product is called magnesium oxide because it's actually a mixture of magnesium and oxygen. So that extra 50 grams that we get down here comes from those oxygen molecules that get incorporated into magnesium. So we just looked at an example of how uh, products could get heavier than their reactants due to gases being incorporated. So now let's look at an example of how products could become lighter than the reactants due to gases. So let's say I have this test tube and I take, um, let's say I take 73 grams of acid and I throw it in my test tube and I take 100 grams of carbonate and throw it in my test tube as well. Um, you guys can already predict what's going to happen, and the picture shows us um, these two. When these two reactants combine, they're going to fizz up and produce a gas. Um, and hopefully, we all know that it's carbon dioxide gas that gets produced. And after after the reaction is over, I weigh my I weigh my products, and I only get. 139 grams, but the total of my reactants before I started had been 173 grams, right? 100 plus 73. So what happened to those extra 24 grams? Well, what? Um, so as you maybe are guessing at this point. What happened to those extra grams is they bubbled away as carbon dioxide. So we see these bubbles, and what we're getting is the release of CO2, and of course those CO2 molecules have their own mass, and they float away as a gas and leave us with a lighter product than what we started with. So we didn't create or destroy any atoms, we didn't break our rule, we simply lost our gases we simply lost our products as gases into the air, and that's why our products got lighter. So, we can sum up what we've been talking about so far in, in a theory. And the theory is called the conservation of mass. So, just like last term, we talked about the conservation of energy as a theory that was always true. This is similarly a theory of physics that has no exceptions. And the theory of conservation of mass states that mass is never created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So I promised that, uh, that you would hear this a lot today in our lesson, and so I'm going to repeat it one more time. 
so that we all never forget it and we understand that there's no exceptions to this rule. And that's why I even put it in orange to make sure it's emphasized. So the conservation of mass states that mass is never created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. So one common misconception that people have is that if we, if we, for instance, take a hot cup of tea and pour sugar into it, it looks like the sugar kind of disappears, right, because it gets dissolved. And so you might suspect that if you weighed your hot cup of tea before you added sugar, let's say you weighed it and it weighed 100, um, 100 grams, and you added 50 grams of sugar to that water, and you weighed it afterwards, you might expect it to weigh the same as the hot water did in the beginning, because that sugar seemed to just disappear, right? But that would be breaking the rule of conservation of mass, and, and it's a rule that has no exceptions. So what actually happens when we dissolve things in water is the masses uh, of the two substances add together. So here's an example down at the bottom of the page where we start with 100 grams of water, we add 20 grams of salt, and we stir them together, the salt completely dissolves, and we end up with 120 grams of a salt solution in the end because we cannot create or destroy mass. So all the mass that we started with which was 120 total grams, all ended up in our final product, which also weighed 120 grams. So that's the theory of the conservation of mass. All right, let's quickly review what we talked about today. So we started by explaining that in a chemical reaction, the atoms in the reactants get jumbled around and rearranged, and they join together in new combinations to form new products. So the iron molecule that used to be on its own joined together with the sulfate to make iron sulfate and the copper atom then ended up on its own. And remember that no atoms can be created or destroyed so that's why um, when we react magnesium with oxygen we need to make two molecules of magnesium oxide because we started with two molecules of oxygen and that's also why we need the number two in front of magnesium. So that's called a balanced chemical equation. Then we give then we gave an example of um, the implications of the fact that atoms are never created or destroyed, and we saw that if we start with 56 grams of one reactant and add it to 160 grams of a second reactant, then the mass of our product must be 216 grams, and there's no exceptions to this rule. Though there's a couple examples where it seems like it it might be an exception. But when we actually work out the details, we figure out that whenever it seems, whenever there seems to be an exception, gases are probably to blame. So when we burn magnesium, we add oxygen molecules from the air to make magnesium oxide, so our product gets heavier. When we combine acids with carbonates, we lose CO2 as a gas, so our products seem lighter. So whenever we, whenever we seem like we're breaking the rule of conservation of mass, Gases are usually to blame, so always think about what gases are present in your reaction. And finally, we stated explicitly that the conservation of mass theory states, mass is never created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. I want everybody to be able to come to class and chant this theory out loud from, from memory, because it's that important to this unit. So just like um, if you add sugar to, to tea or if you add salt to water, However much mass you start with, which was here was 120 grams, you have to get out the equal amount of mass in your products, which was 120 grams. All right, great work today, and we'll catch you back for the final topic in Unit H, which will be the proving of the theory of the conservation of mass. Thanks.